Thank you very much. And we see a nice dualism here. Uh, we have three potentially positive terms, and I think we heard today in the second talk uh, by Tim that uh, you can choose any two out of the three, so we will see uh, which uh, of the two, uh, which of the three will be chosen. So the uh, background to the talk is that we see a, currently a trend in industry that uh, everything is moving towards the cloud and towards a new environment which is called a serverless computing environment, and nobody really knows what it means. But everybody tries to sell it, right? Um, and so as a University of Applied Sciences, where I am working, uh, it is our task to, first of all, explore and analyze what is available, but second of all, also to provide the means to make use of the new facilities without falling into some of the uh, traps. So I'm uh, working at the university as a lecturer. I teach Python. We graduate, I think, around 270 um, Python students per year. But most of the time, actually, I'm involved in research and I've been using uh, the language as well for most of our prototyping needs. The use of Python dates back to way before I joined uh, the university in uh, Zurich. Uh, I probably started around 15 years ago, and as you grow older and more experienced, uh, you probably become more conservative and values are important in life, so I have two core values, two constants that never change. First of all, my code is still bad, and second of all, my slides are still bad, so you will have to live with that. Uh, maybe a bit of introduction. Uh, what's serverless computing? It's essentially a marketing term around a service uh, offering, uh, which is called function as a service, which in the traditional cloud computing stacks would be uh, located mostly on the platform as a service layer. So you can say it's a refinement of the platform as a service idea where you can run individual functions in the cloud and you really only pay for each invocation. So when the function is not used, you don't pay anything, which is a very uh, intriguing concept, obviously, and uh, for a lot of applications, not for all applications, but for a lot of applications, it makes perfect sense to host your application in such a model. So if your application is not extremely popular, you are going to save a lot of money if you are the person operating uh, or providing the application. And so the term serverless is because it is seemingly serverless. You do not interact with the servers, uh, with the infrastructure, with the resources directly anymore. But of course, you are still exposed to some of the configuration options which um, concern the resources, for example, how much memory do you allocate to each function that you want to run, you will find out if the function fails that probably you did not allocate a sufficient amount of memory. What are those functions? Are they really like, let's say, Python functions? Well, typically what is offered as a function is called a function app or a function unit can be a function in the programming sense, but it can also be a container or an application package which are more traditional paths and container platform uh, options. Of course, this being a Python event, we will look at the uh, first option where the function we are going to run are actual Python functions. So a developer's vision, uh, what do developers want? And we are currently with, uh, jointly with two other research institutes performing a survey among developers and ask them, what do you want uh, in such serverless uh, environments? What do you need? What are the pain points? Because our mission in the end is to combine the technological expertise with um, our scientific excellence, with having a neutral view on uh, all the developments in order to be able to support Swiss uh, companies. And if we take a very sober look, we see that there's still a huge gap between the marketing message and uh, the uh, reality. It's probably not a good idea to include this, this picture. It's from Aleppo. It's actually very sad. But um, if you look into the world of cloud computing, we have tried to map it somehow, right? Because uh, we need a vendor-neutral or cross-vendor approach of figuring this out. And we see in the upper left corner the major cloud providers. Obviously, they are all active in the field. We see a couple of specialized providers uh, shown below them. And we see a couple of open source tools uh, which uh, work 
uh, mostly complementary to the commercial services. And on the right side, we see a couple of runtimes which uh, are increasingly emerging to emulate essentially the behavior of the function runtimes of the uh, commercial providers. If we take uh, a look at, uh, from a Python perspective, in which of these services can we run Python, um, it's not too bad. So Python is essentially the number two supported language. It's not supported by all of the services. So among the big players, I think Google is most known for supporting only uh, JavaScript uh, in their runtime. And some of the other runtimes are not supporting Python as well. But in the majority of frameworks, it is supported. Uh, the underlined frameworks you see on the right side are the ones which come from our research lab. I will introduce them uh, during uh, the talk. You'll see that at least two of them are also uh, supporting Python very well. If you take a more concrete uh, look at the runtimes, we see that there are about 15 uh, or 20 runtimes that we can uh, distinguish by now, and they all have a varying amount of language support. Whenever I show this table at the conference, it is immediately outdated, right? Because there are changes going on. It's mostly completing. But then again, the support, the actual support for each language differs from it barely runs to it is well supported. There are SDKs, there are debugging tools, and so forth. So when we look from a Python perspective, then we see that maybe around eight of the runtimes are of uh, very much uh, importance to be analyzed in terms of when we want to run our Python applications in such serverless environments, which path should we take? Should we go to AWS? Should we go to OVH? Should we go to Fission, uh, which runs on top of Kubernetes? And that has to be seen. From a historical point of view, um, initially the first Python implementations were still Python 2. At the time when Python 3 was actually out there and very mature, so um, for some reason, Python 2 was chosen. Uh, basically, all of the providers and all of the um, framework developers then switched to Python 3 around last year. So you can see uh, that apart from Open Lambda, which is an almost that research prototype, uh, basically all the runtimes now support Python 3. So it's a safe choice. So we can conclude that in general, we have very good support for open source tools in the serverless environments, very good support for Python 3, everything as well, right? But we do have a couple of bad news as well. So first of all, the dominant large cloud providers, and they are often the ones which are somehow used in application projects, um, do not open source their runtimes, or not everything of it in any case. The first use barrier is still high. It's, again, a new set of APIs you will have to learn. You cannot just start, uh, open your editor of writing functions, and you'll be done with it. And of course, there is a lot of heterogeneity. There are no standards. Every provider will require their own format. I will skip the other points, because these are already the main objections that we can have. So let's look in detail at some of the functions that we can deploy at the providers. If we look at AWS Lambda, which has been the first major such service, you see that every function essentially requires two arguments, an event, which is your own data structure. You can define in, in terms of, uh, of a dictionary what data you want to bring into the function, and you get a context object. The context object is essentially instantiated by the runtime itself. It provides you information such as where do you actually execute the function, because you can hardly choose that by yourself. You are no longer dealing with servers. Or how many seconds do you have left in your function? So you should periodically query this object, because there is typically a timeout associated to each such function, typically after five minutes, or in the case of Google Cloud, in nine minutes um, execution time. The execution is terminated, and no state is saved. So you better query from time to time, do I have sufficient time in my function to complete the job or go to the next job. So that brings us to one of the key characteristics of those functions. They are completely stateless. You cannot save any data except when you bind to external services. You see the other formats, they are all differing. If you want to go to the IBM cloud, you suddenly deal with dictionary in, dictionary out. 
When you go to OVH functions, you deal with dictionary in but string out. When you go to fission, you deal with nothing in, but you have to request the data manually from a Flask object. So if you don't use Flask, you're pretty much in trouble and string out. And if you go to Azure, I won't comment on that one. Um, <laughs> you can as well write everything by yourself, right? <laughs> so um, things are improving now. There are a couple of abstraction frameworks which at least make the deployment easier. You can now deploy to several of those uh, providers by using something like a serverless framework. Um, or there's a Lambda uploader written in Python. They are very interesting frameworks. However, there are still issues when it comes to the programming itself, and these frameworks do not solve the differences in the syntax and synopsis of the functions. If you look at a few Python-specific approaches, there's PyVren, which has been one of the first academic approaches um, targeting especially scientists who have not so much experience in programming. You can essentially set up a PyVren executor. It's the um, PWEX uh, object, and you can just give it a local function, and the function will be serialized, uploaded to Amazon S3, and will be executed in Lambda. All of that happens behind the scenes, so if you are not familiar with the whole technology, you just add those additional lines of code, the two lines uh, below the function, and the function will just work. One shortcoming, obviously, is that this uh, tool is very much bound to AWS, so you cannot change providers easily. Another approach is uh, the one uh, called Lambada from Carson Guy. Um, it is essentially a bit like Flask for uh, serverless computing. So again, you have your function, you set up a tune object, uh, which is a, an object of class Lambada, you set up the configuration parameters, you want it to be hosted in a certain region of Amazon, and you set up the memory, and you can uh, essentially uh, use that one um, to create wrapper objects, as is shown below, using the uh, decorator uh, uh, dancer, which is uh, essentially their word for worker. Um, Again, it is bound to AWS, uh, and essentially it creates zip packages which you can upload by yourself, or it automatically uploads them. It bypasses the need to go to S3. It's already a bit less depending on Amazon, but it still is depending on it. Now, when I came across that framework, I was very confused because I wrote a package called Lambada myself at that time to make it easier uh, to handle, so I compared the first commit uh, times, and uh, we can see that my Lambada was started about around uh, five months uh, before uh, Carson's uh, Lambada, um, but I did not maybe advertise it enough. And second of all, I failed to register the PyPy, the Python package index namespace in time. So kudos to Carson, he, get, he got the Lambada uh, project. Uh, if you look for my Lambada, and I will just show you uh, the, the tool from Git, uh, it's called Lambada Transformer on uh, PyPy. There are a couple of even older Lambadas, so we are, both of us we were not the first to think about this name, but none of them are Python related, right? So they're all Java related. So, oh, my Lambada. What does it do? Uh, it allows you to add a decorator to a function. Sounds familiar, looks like the other Lambada. Uh, but uh, the difference here is that uh, it actually works on a source code transformation level. So Lambada produces a rewritten source file so that you can upload the function to, uh, at the moment, Amazon Lambda. That would not be a big difference to the other Lambada, except that we are currently working on a converter, which uh, makes it possible to also transform into the other formats using the same tool. Um, and I think the best way to show the tool is to try it out, right? Going away with the error message, using a scratch space. Uh, let's call it SPS 18. And let's first of all clone from some GitLab or GitHub. So in our research lab, we have the mandate that every tool must be usable directly after the Git checkout. There should be no requirement of configuring anything. Um, let's see if this works. 
uh, let's write our test function. Um, I think everybody wants to win a pie board, right? And in order to win the pie board, you need to give the name who is the mayor of Rapperswil Jona. Let's make it a constant function, and of course, everybody knows that uh, Hido van Rossum <laughs> is the mayor, right? You should all put this into your sheet. You will not increase your chances, but you will increase my chances if you do so. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's run Lambada on this function, and what it does, it tries to figure out what is my uh, Amazon uh, configuration, and then it creates the zip file and uploads that uh, so the Lambda, and now we go into the uh, Lambda console and we check under functions, we have uh, this function and uh, we can just execute it by running test. We need to give it a test name. We have some input data which we absolutely uh, don't need. Um, we will nevertheless leave it there. We create the test function and if we click test again, we get the output that Hido uh, van Rossum, and it must be true if Lambda says so, right, uh, is the mayor of Rapperswil Jona. Now, that tool is uh, certainly useful from a developer perspective. Um, as I mentioned, we are currently working on uh, an associated tool, which uh, you already, I think, find a preliminary version of it in the Git repository. Uh, to make portable cloud functions possible, which is quite important in order to avoid vendor logins. But we also need to cover the runtime side, and that's probably the more important uh, tool in the long term. We do not want to run our cloud functions, our cloud applications, always at any of the, let's say, four or five big providers that are out there. And so we need a tool which makes it also possible to deploy and execute on a private cloud environment, on our servers, on our developer notebooks, on our research notebooks. And we have come up with the idea of a Swiss Army knife tool for serverless computing. It should have all the qualities of a Swiss Army knife. I typically have one with me, um, not always because of flight restrictions, right? So then I have to leave it at home. Um, so it should be robust, it should be small, it should be versatile, it should be useful in all sorts of daily life situations that you never imagined would happen, right? Um, and so that triggered the design of the tool. I'm not sure uh, where to start in the architecture diagram, but uh, of course, what we have seen so far are the functions, right? So they are the central part. And you write a function and then you want to execute them. Uh, the tool should even though it's written in Python, we are also friendly to the other languages, you sh should be able to write your functions also in other languages. So we need a lot of parsers. That's down here, right? And so the parsers uh, pass the Python source files and extract all sorts of functions that they want to execute. And that's already an advantage over the uh, runtimes you typically find at commercial providers where you can only have one entrance point in each source file and you need to go through some hoops to make it possible to have multiple entrance points, whereas in our tool, which is called Snafu, you can basically execute any function and any method which is found in the source file. The execution then is triggered by an event, and the event, you see the connectors down here, can be an explicit HTTP request, it can be a cron job, it can be a change in the file system, it can be an XMPP message, it can be, of course, the user him or herself by entering the function name in the CLI. Once a function is specified and the arguments are given, it is executed by an executor. We have a couple of Python 3 executors um, in the commercial clouds. It's all about isolation and making sure everything is secure, which is all fine, but for research purposes, we also need the raw Python performance from time to time, right? So we have a Python 3 in process, execution. Essentially, Snafu will just execute the function, and if the function calls exit, then Snafu will exit. Use at your own risk. Python 3 isolated, does not have this problem, communicates with an external Python um, interpreter. Python 3 external is very similar. Python 3 tracing has been contributed already by students, traces the function, and 
uh, does some benchmarking, where are the bottlenecks in terms of networking, CPU, memory, and so forth. And very interesting, LXC, you can virtualize your function execution, you can still have a bit of isolation around it by uh, transparently running through an LXC Linux containers context. There's a very nice Python binding, so the implementation of that took 10 minutes. Um, we do have a little bit of Python 2 support, Java, C, and uh, Node.js as well, uh, in case you will need it. What is very interesting is that even though you can use it as a developer tool or, let's say, for research purposes, you can also run it as a daemon, right, as a server process. And uh, when you do that, it needs to offer a certain API, and I was thinking which API should it offer, and then I was telling myself it should not offer yet another API, but it should offer all of the APIs of the large cloud providers so that all of the tools in this ecosystem that already exist can be used with Snafu and it can become a drop-in replacement. Interestingly, the namespaces of the APIs of Amazon, Google, IBM, and so forth, they don't overlap, right? They have proper namespaces, which means that within such a uh, daemon, you can implement all of them at once. And that is what is done, so you can use the Amazon tools to upload functions to Snafu, you can use the Microsoft tools, you can use the Google tools. I'm fine with whatever tool you use, as long as you use Snafu in the back end, right? So, uh, there is a couple of... Uh, uh, security um, packages uh, uh, involved, so Amazon came up with their own crypto algorithm, which is called AWS4, which thankfully was properly documented, so uh, that one is now also supported uh, by uh, Snafu. And if you leave the main architecture and go to the top of the uh, picture here, you will see that uh, we also have integration uh, with a tool called Snafu Import, which actually started as a pure import tool, but now as a, an import-export tool, so you can pull your functions from Lambda, modify them, test them locally, upload them to IBM Cloud Functions, and you can have such workflows where you do not really depend anymore on those commercial um, environments for executing the functions. A couple of use cases of you can, and we will just do that in a minute, uh, directly clone uh, Snafu from GitLab. You can obviously, if you uh, like working with Python packages, uh, install the Python package. Uh, Snafu, thankfully, was not yet taken by anybody else. You can obviously run the entire um, project in Docker. There's a prepared Docker image. And we even have set up a multi-tenant mode where you can run Snafu in a way that each registered user gets his or her own instance very much isolated from the other users. And we have implemented that on Apuyo, the Swiss container platform, um, which means that uh, essentially by calling a, an OpenShift deployment descriptor, you can just um, install uh, all of Snafu, uh, including the multi-tenancy configuration, into your uh, OpenShift account or Apuyo account. We also have raw Kubernetes support, there is, for example, the European Grid Initiative. We have integration with them. It's essentially a research grid or, or research cloud uh, for researchers all across Europe. They offer now Kubernetes as a service, and we also have a Snafu integration with them. So you can have it in public clouds. You can have it in private clouds. You can have it in, on your own notebook. I think it's a versatile tool which you can use to test your functions even though you may want to run them in another environment in production in the future, but you probably do not want to pay for the testing, right, and for the debugging. Some uh, examples of how to do that, let's say you want to import a script, you call now for import, you give the source um, provider, let's say IBM Cloud Functions, and you give the target provider, let's say uh, Uplus, because you want to run a serverless framework on top of Kubernetes, which is locally installed. And then you have to redirect the provider tools. In AWS, uh, in the AWS CLI, for example, you have to just set the endpoint to the local uh, installation. So normally, if you don't specify a different port, it will listen on port 10,000, which is probably not the best choice, but I was lazy to think of a different port number. In the case of OpenWhisk, which is the open source runtime by IBM, you just need to set for once the property of the endpoint. In the case of Google, well, Google uses some very obscure 
um, authentication slash security scheme. So you cannot use an endpoint different from the Google Cloud with their tools uh, unless you patch the Google Cloud SDK. Um, and the patch is included in Snafo, so you just need to run the script and your Google Cloud SDK is patched so that you can use uh, a cloud provider which is not called Google. A couple of additional examples. I think we will run this. Um, we still have a couple of minutes from uh, Git. In that case, it's uh, on GitHub. So when you run it for the first time, since it also will execute Java and C functions, uh, it will need to compile them first. So the default Git repository has a couple of example functions, and you will see that um, <coughs> you will have uh, to run Snafu in a way that uh, the modules are compiled first, and then we get a very nice um, error message, which is probably due to me not having pushed the latest version to GitHub, so let me quickly cheat. I will fix this uh, after the talk. So let me use the, the version in my development uh, directory. And so what happens is that uh, it activates the parsers, it passes all the files that it can f find uh, in its own directory tree. You can also point it to a different directory tree and it sets up the executors and then you set up um, the function name, hello world, dot hello world, for example, and uh, you execute it, it gives you the timing information. And that is typically what a function as a service environment does. It executes a function. It's in itself nothing spectacular, right? Um, there are a couple of uh, further ways to invoke the functions. I will skip over that part. It's pretty much documented in a step-by-step -step tutorial, which you can find uh, when you go to the PyPy Side, and from there you go to read the docs documentation. Uh, the same for obviously the uh, daemon mode. And as a last slide, I want to introduce some of the research we are working on. So one of the research projects is to have a fully decentralized marketplace for functions so that we do not rely on AWS marketplace or GitHub or any of the centralized uh, systems which are all, in the end, uh, somehow fueled by venture capital, right? We want to have a fully decentralized system. Uh, we are currently in the design stage, but we already have some prototypes. So if you're interested in some of our tools, such as our function hub, where you can upload and download functions in a sort of community style, then feel free um, to contact uh, me and my team. And that concludes the talk. There's a lot coming up, obviously, uh, in terms of the directions we are heading to, and if anybody's interested in the topic of serverless specifically, we also have, by the end of the year, a community event uh, in the uh, Tony Areal in Zurich. Thank you very much.